Almost 50 years ago, the first regular airline flying boat service commenced, in, commenced operations in Australia. And since then, flying boats have played a very significant part in Australia's aviation history. The last flying boat service was the Lord Howe Island service, operated by Ansett Airlines, and it ceased in 1974. Who knows that someday in the future we will see the return of a modern flying boat. But in the meantime, let's go back to 1974 and the ships that flew. The flying boat after the war was an orphan, and an extremely inconvenient orphan. It threatened the astronomical investment now concentrated in land airports and their increasingly magnificent terminals. Well, uh, uh, the comparatively high-cost aircraft this is one of the principal reasons. The other, of course, is that they're terribly slow. But well, weather is a big problem. Uh, the uh, actual Met reporting service these days is basically for the high-flying jet. Lord Howe uh, uh, is a small island. Um, it takes us approximately three and a half hours to fly there. We, we have had uh, cases where we take off from here uh, on a particular Met forecast. By the time we get to Lord Howe, it's completely changed. Uh, we've had to turn around and come back to that land. Well, that's another area that we're very sensitive to, of course, because we have to pick up the tab. And at this very moment, um, not for, through weather problems, but through, for other reasons, um, uh, we've got uh, 130 people over there on the island, and it's costing us uh, $1,200 a day to keep them there. Um, we don't see any, any, um, any solution in sight to this problem, so goodness knows what the final bill is going to be. Um, the second one, BRF, which is the one we converted here, uh, that was actually a military Sunderland. And I think the, uh, the total bill uh, from start to finish uh, would have been somewhere in the region of a quarter of a million dollars. So, uh, as you can see, uh, for an old aircraft, um, to have to pay that price for it in uh, 1963, uh, sort of highlights some of the problems associated with these things. One, of course, uh, that you're restricted in the utilisation because there's only one service offering these days, and that is between Sydney and Lord Howe. So we're only achieving, uh, at the most, 900 hours flying out of two boats. That's 450 each per boat. Well, you compare that with a, an average land plane's up to 3,500 hours per annum. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why it's uneconomical. It was around about 1952, a very great friend of mine rang me up and he said, how would you like to fly flying boats? I think my reaction was, oh, no. He said, well, come on down to the flying boat base and see what you think. Well, I came down to the base here. I did a flight over to Lord Howe. I liked it. I think I liked flying boats. So he said, well, uh, we only need a flying boat captain for 12 months, and of course, here it is now. I'm still on them after 22 years.
1952, very, very crowded. Of course, Qantas were operating their uh, Plymouth and Sandringham through to New Guinea. Transoceanic Airways, of course, had Solent and uh, a Hive. They were operating uh, New Guinea, Hobart, and Lord Howe Island. Then Teal, as Air New Zealand, as it's uh, known now, they were operating Solent across the Tasman. So it was quite crowded. They even had a tower here with traffic controllers, and uh, of course, it's not like today where uh, we have a very sedate, gentlemanly life. Sir Gordon Taylor was the first man to fly across the Indian Ocean, first to cross the Central Pacific from Mexico to Australia, first to South America and back, navigator of the first aircraft to fly from Australia to North America. The purpose of the flight is to survey this route across to South America uh, for an airline that will follow and uh, to reach out in a gesture of friendship to the people across the other side of the Pacific. Thank you. The longest, hardest and most demanding of his flights was the return journey from Australia to South America via Easter Island in 1951. Easter Island was just an absolute dot, 3,000 miles from anywhere. And Jack Percival, who uh, was one of the crew on the aircraft, told me that uh, he was getting a little worried himself. He was uh, wondering when this dot would appear on the scene. And uh, yeah, P.G. Taylor said to him, well, Jack, I think uh, we'll probably see this in about uh, 27 and a half minutes. Jack could hardly believe this, but uh, right on the very dot, at uh, 27 and a half minutes later, this tiny speck appeared on the horizon, much to the relief of all those on that frigate bird, flying bird. I think his greatest notoriety, you might say, was in that he was a magnificent navigator. I would say probably one of the best in the world ever. I think navigation to Bill Taylor was a religion. The flight was a success, a hands across the Pacific gesture. Two great continents, Australia and South America, were joined by air. I saw the cruising flying boat as a goodwill ship, another instance of the aircraft as a means of contact between people. And through that contact, the development of a thought which had come out of the air when I flew as a fighter pilot in the First World War. But this new freedom we'd found in the high air, the freedom of flight, should be applied to a better knowledge and relationship between people, instead of to kill them as then was our function. One day, Stuart Middlemas, who I had known in the war, asked me to go up to Rathmines, the Air Force base, and look at some Catalinas with him. After we'd looked at the cats, uh, I noticed five Sunderland flying boats at their moorings out in the bay. I'd never been on board one of these aircraft, so I thought this was a good opportunity, and asked someone to run me out. As soon as I stepped on board, I realized I was on a rather remarkable aeroplane. In fact, it wasn't an aeroplane, it was uh, a ship, a ship that flew. The interior was something to dream about. For real comfort, for spacious ease, and the attractive and livable effect achieved with a kind of relaxing understatement, I've never seen an aircraft, even today, to equal it. Here was the bridge of a ship. No cramped little pigeon house where you have to get in with a shoehorn and out like a contortionist. When I sat in the port seat, the whole aeroplane seemed naturally to come under my control through my hands on the wheel and my feet on the rudder pedals. So when 
I got home, I said to my wife, somebody at Rathmine said I would buy a Sunderland. Well, she obviously wasn't listening, or she was thinking of something else, because she said, well, why don't you? Well, about two months later, to my horror and great consternation, I found I was the owner of five four-engine flying boats, and 22 spare engines, to say nothing of the uh, hangar full of spare parts. I suppose the most uh, exciting thing was the fact that the first revenue we earned was a phone call from uh, now Sir Reginald Ansett, asking me or if I could uh, be chartered with my Catalina to take him on a survey of the Barrier Reef Islands. And away we went. We landed at Heron Island, into Lindemann Island and Daydream Island, and eventually to an island with a little shack on the beach called Hayman Island. So we dropped anchor and he went ashore in a little dinghy that a fellow had rowed out to the flying boat. After about an hour's uh, visitation to the island, he came back on board and said, well, I've taken a 99-year lease on that island. External, internal. Very nice. Belt seat and rudders. Very nice. Controls. Trim tabs. Went through and zero. Zero, zero. Bubble, Check. Shut up valves. Open. Gyros. Speed valves. They're open. Flap indicator. On. Flaps. Flaps are in. Bubbles. Primed and set. Mixtures. Idle cutter. Pitch. Fine. Four lights. Inverter. Inverter still off. And the aircraft clear. Aircraft clear. And starting the engine. Back. She passed the entrance island and opened out into the Great Lagoon. The wind was steady from the east, offering itself for the takeoff. The moon was drawing the ocean to the time of high water, and the swell was coming in over the reef. I sat and watched the swell as we ran through the pre-flight checks. Then I let her come round and up to the wind. She faced the lagoon for a moment of contemplation. And then I gave her full power. The swell was there, but harmless. She protested a little, but it was only to let me know her mood. The slight backward pressure on the control column restored her equilibrium and suggested a way of escape to the air. She responded with confidence and soon was running light and true upon the surface. A touch of the tail trim, and I broke her away when she was ready.
was great difficulty in mooring uh, a flying boat at Lord Howe Island due to the very exposed nature of the lagoon, the prevalence of cyclonic winds and gale force winds. In the case of uh, our flying boat mooring there, you have a seven eight cable attached to the bow of the aircraft which is attached to the normal mooring buoy. Now when you get these mountainous seas that pound in over the reef, the aircraft, which is not built solidly like a boat, it's light in construction, it's meant to fly. And a huge swell comes through and the old girl rides up on the swell and it's then lifted in an attitude with its wings are there for lift and the swell goes through and you get this tremendous snatch as it goes belting down the swell and of course you've got 20 tons of aeroplane that are banging on that mooring. Over here at Lord Howe it's uh, 480 uh, statute miles away from Rose Bay and it's always uh, afforded us a lot of problems uh, in uh, handling flying boats. Over the years three flying boats have been washed ashore in gale force winds and mountainous seas in 1950, we had the Qantas Catalina. That was lost. Uh, in 1963, our own Pacific Chieftain in gale force winds again and mountainous seas. It was belted onto the beach and the float knocked off and severely damaged and uh, we couldn't repair that. It was so badly damaged. Well, I think it happened at around about midnight on Sunday night. We were all pulled out of bed, my crew and I, and we raced down to the beach. And this dreadful sight when we got there, a poor old beach coma with its wing and its float bashed into the side of the beach. The main plane had been badly dented, and of course, as the sea came in and the wind howled, the float was bashed under the hull, and the tip, of course, is badly irreparable. The flying boat will never come back. Not on the international airlines. It will be used for certain specialised military purposes which can be fulfilled only by a water-based aircraft. But it will never be given a chance to raise its head above the surface with this gigantic world investment in land airports standing over it.